Okay, Nick Ashford, Valerie Simpson, thank you and welcome. My name is Ken Whisaker. I'm the Director of Intellectual Publics, uh, which is coming to you tonight from the Graduate Center CUNY. Um, I want to, before we get started, thank Chelsea Largent and John Kianese for um, all the work to get us to this place, because uh, tonight we have a very special event and one I've been looking forward to personally for a very long time, Jafari Allen and Kevin Kwashi on the occasion of Jafari's new book, There is a Disco Ball Between Us, A Theory of Black Gay Life, and of Kevin's almost as new one, Black Aliveness. Uh, at one point, Jafari describes a between as a shared conversation, space of open conversation or question, sometimes a shared tension, but we hope not tonight. Enough of that around us. Um, but this kind of gathering, this friendship that the book is all about, the people who are gathered here in the audience who are some in the book, some thanked in the book, it's just a very special moment. Uh, performance theorist Deanna Taylor, when talking about revising a manuscript, says the moment of truth is when it all stands up like a play being walked through on stage rather than sitting on a page. Mm -hmm. Here in Jafari's book, I think, and tonight, the world stands up, or rather, worlds stand up. The disco ball between us, the reflections, the Atlantic, the parties, the reading, the reflection, a capacious journey between Trinidad and Tobago, Rio, Nairobi, London, Toronto, Miami, New York, many of whom represented here, uh, the shared legacy of Black lesbian thought and Black queer histories. And tonight, Jafari in conversation with Kevin Kwashi, another poet of the relational and the space of possibility. I love this quote from the beginning of Black aliveness. To behold such aliveness, we have to imagine a Black world. We have to imagine a Black world so as to surpass the everywhere and every way of Black death of blackness that is understood only through such a vocabulary. Jafari Sinclair Allen is the author of There's a Disco Ball Between Us, A Theory of Black Gay Life, which was published by Duke University Press on Earth this month. Uh, is the inaugural co-director of the University of Miami Center for Global Black Studies. His scholarship and teaching has opened new lines of inquiry and offered reinvigorated methods of black feminist narrative theorizing and anthropology, black studies, queer studies. Professor Allen is also the author of Vincent Ramos, Vincent Ramos, uh, The Erotics of Black Self-Making in Cuba, and editor of the GLQ special issue, Black Queer Diaspora, is currently at work on two more monographs. Um, Marooned in Miami, Ecology of Black Life on an Edge, and Structural Adjustment, Global Black Survival in the 1980s. And still to me, it's worth noting this um, uh, moving toward history moment that in 2012, while still at Yale, Jafari taught the first queer studies course at Morehouse, Black Queer History right here in the house. Kevin Kwashi teaches Black Cultural and Literary Studies and is a professor in the Department of English at Brown University. Primarily, he focuses on Black feminism queer studies and aesthetics, especially poetics. He's the author or editor of four books, most recently, The Sovereignty of Quiet, Beyond Resistance in Black Culture from Rutgers in 2012, and Black Aliveness or Poetics of Being from Duke in 2021. Currently, he's thinking about a book of Black sentences and Black ideas. Um, they're going to talk until about 7.40. We'll have time for questions. Uh, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function for them. Everyone's welcome to use the chat. You can put your questions in both places. But since Kevin will be taking the questions directly, you will make his life easier if the questions are actually in the Q&A. Uh, welcome, and thank you both so much for being here. I'm, I can't wait. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, thanks to Chelsea Largent and John Cianisi for organizing things, and I hope everyone who's here is well and safe. Jafari Sinclair Allen, dear Jafari, how are you? How are you feeling? Well, 
Um, I'm feeling dear Kevin Everard Kwashi. Uh, I'm feeling grateful, grateful for Chelsea and to John and to Ken for the space and to you, uh, Ken mentioned um, at the beginning of, of your last book and one of the from the amendments that I would say is this meticulous Black imagination, this studied, careful uh, work that you do. I'm, I'm grateful for you, grateful for you being here. And so how do I feel? I feel grateful and I feel tender, um, which has mm -hmm. come to be my way of being in the world, which is okay. Um, and I'm used to feeling tender here at my desk working. Um, and so this is, this is how I am in this world where things are burning, where people are leaving this earth, other people are coming into this earth. There's more work to do. There's a tenderness that is required of me, I think, that I'm feeling right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being so, so open about that. And, and in a way, right, tender can also mean um, a way that one beholds or a way that one exchanges something. And so I hope this isn't too intimate a thing to say in the capacity of our friendship. If you are tender, my dear baby, let us hold you. Um, let us hold you in this moment of, I have to briefly say, the, the beauty and care and stylishness of your work in this book, which is such a phenomenal, expansive work, um, historical in its reach and theoretical in its engagements with anthropology and black studies in, in the least, um, personal in, in the way in which you cohere um, a series of personas on the page and invite us to, to study and think and be with you. So baby, let us hold you. Um, and so maybe, maybe could we start by thinking about desire, talking about desire. You say early in the project, and if you'll indulge me reading back to you a couple of your beautiful lines, you write, this is a book about desire, Black desire for political empowerment or autonomy, fun and carefree play in the face of social suffering, an erotic desire for one another. It is also one instantiation of an authorial desire to write the experiences and imagination of blackness into the record in another way. That's from uh, page 11 uh, in, at the beginning of the book. Um, and later when you start talking about Joe Beam, of course, you say again, uh, desire, not shame. And so I wonder if you could just talk about how you understand desire as one of the coordinates you use to try to reckon with this fantastic decade that you rewrite in your project, that you give back to us in your project. Mm. I'm, um, I'm glad that I spent some of the time listening to Bougie Bougie sharpening my, my pencil. Um, I knew that you would offer me something that I'll need to reconsider again. Uh, desire, yeah, desire is at the at the center of this project and multifaceted desire. There was a there was a moment at which uh, I wanted the book to begin with that uh, begin with that piece that you talked about at Joe Beam that the book would begin. Joe Beam was my first because that. Um, my figuring Joe, whom I didn't know, as my possibility, um, and I say something like the man that I could become and the man that I could have, and it's all conflated with the work, um, that this is one of the, one of the driving forces uh, for me to enter into community, to enter into Black gay politics when I did in, in the 19... 80s and it is of course also you know for those who want to those who want to read freud into it about the libidinal and, and about the about eros and that being a life force not just uh not just a sexual force but about eros which it goes back to some of the first 
some of the work I did in the first book around uh, the erotic and the uses, following Audrey, the uses of the erotic. Um, but it's, it's also um, my desire to rethink the way that queer theory had centered shame mm. um, while mm. what was happening, <laughs> what it grew out of and what was happening on the street was, I think, about desire and about uh, desire and its and the anger that's also in there, the anger and the grief. And so uh, it all comes together for me. And I thought that by being clear with my dear reader in the beginning that it would help to orient um, us as we begin the, the journey toward thinking through all of this to understand that burning desire to, to do work, to create, to keep each other alive, to keep ourselves alive, to have one another, to twirl and to have fun. Um, and that that all comes together. That doesn't need to be bracketed to be understood. As a matter of fact, I think that part of what I try to perform here is that one way to understand it is not to bracket it, is to give it, is, is to, give it to you um, in concentric circles um, mm. in various ways. Mm. The, the breadth of how you've just articulated desire speaks at least to two things, one of which you just mentioned explicitly, right? The, the invitation you make to the reader at the beginning, which if one is, if, if one takes the invitation seriously, one tracks how you, the speaker on the page and making that invitation is at once asking the reader to be capable of a whole number of things, um, mm. including the way in which you are at once welcoming, you're, you're cautionary in, in that welcome, um, so, so snarky and playful, and uh, right as if to say, like, if, if we are going to do this, which is to behold this decade in another way, I'll come back to that in a minute, that we have to be more voluptuous, more capable than we have to prove ourselves to be. And then the second thing is just in, in the little bit that I read, you, you are so astute to the idea of the black queer subject who is at once vulnerable to and also beyond state power vulnerable mm -hmm. to state power and beyond state power. And so the, as you talk about Eros as a life force, as you showcased in your previous work, there's this press about like mobilizing the astuteness of desire as a non-state term, even as you are doing a critique of state formations and particularly state brutalities in addition to other things. I, I, I love that, I love the way in which you situate us in, in what is precisely a, a, a desirous overture from the very beginning, and then take us through many iterations of that in the book. Does that, does that work? Is that, is that resonate with your it, understanding of the project? It does. And I think that, I, I think that the, the way that I, I reformulate it now is around you know, teaching and also new projects to think about how I've tried um, with this work. And I think that some of it grows out of um, thinking through a lot of the work that really influenced me in graduate school and in the beginning of my career. And you know, I'd like to say that um, one of the things that happened is that you know, in graduate school and during the first part of field work, that I was going around seeing resistance everywhere. I'm like, there's, there it is, and every, and it was all about, uh, it was all about what is not what the state can't get to. Mm. Um, yet my training, yet my training is in empirical research, and I've seen some things, right? And I've heard people, uh, and I've heard people narrate, um, narrate stories that show very clearly um, how how harms how, how how harms have come to them um, and how they were not protected from those harms and at the same time uh have seen ways that we try to shield ourselves from that um some of those progressive some of those not so 
progressive, the ways that we build organizations, we build families, we build, we build friendships, uh, we build ways of, of maneuvering, of dancing around each one of those. And um, I want to always uh, reach for an account that tries to honor all of that at the same time, which means, um, which means that as a, as a social scientist who, um, who, should have, <laughs> who should have a phrase that explains something very clearly and very precisely, mm. I must be a failure, that in order to, to, um, to want to represent the way that I've actually experienced and the way people have told me, that fails. And it also fails to be completely lyrical and completely uh, poetic, divorced from a reality. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, the, the job that I've tried to do is, is a difficult one. And the way that you describe um, that effort is very gratifying to me because it's, it's what, I've, I've tried, what I've tried to do. And what I think I'd like to, I'd like to ask my my students and myself to do more of, and to refine, and to do better next mm. time. Mm. Um, it's. I'm just struck by how. How the last thing you just said, gestures back to the last phrase of the sentence, second sentence I read, it is also one instantiation of an authorial desire to write the experiences and imagination of Blackness into the record in another way. I love that, that, that gesture to another way, because as you talk about the, the potential failure of your doing as a social scientist, that failure allows you to fall into then other registers of doing the work such that it is an ethno as in ethnographic, anthro as in anthropological, um, historic, historical, anthological autopoiesis that you offer to us in the work. And, and even your sense that the poetic alone is not enough because we also need other ways to behold and understand what what human beings are experiencing and to tell this incredible story of the decade of the 80s. So could I, could we move to thinking about the decade of the 80s? That is um, your boldness to to take a decade that's so well historicized and so iconicized in lots of ways in terms of how we think about contemporary American culture and history, for example, ways in which we, th- we think and talk about Blackness and Black popular culture that the 80s res- resonates as such a powerful decade. And yet you rethink the long decade of the 80s through the proliferation and the productivity of Black queer thought and action. And I, I, there are many things I could say about that, but I wonder if you could just say a little bit about your own um, your own thinking about that decade and how you in your mind conceptualize the the temporality of the decade as one through which you could do your method work. Yeah, I'd I'd love to hear more of what, more of how you are thinking of the 80s and the the long 80s. I'll say that um, when you say it, it, uh, it has been iconicized, it, it has, but I think, but that the icon is the icon is corny. The icon, the icon doesn't 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 capture it. And I think it's I think it it seems characterized to mm. me mm. also. Um, and it is also it is such an important consequential period that deserves so much more uh, careful parsing. Um, than we've been able to do so far. And maybe this is, you know, because we've, we've had, you know, some distance from it, uh, that now is the time to begin to think about it. But I don't think, for example, and part of the, part of the reason to continue to think through the long 1980s is that I don't think that, um, especially in the social sciences, that the, the 1980s has been, 
has been dealt with in the careful way that it should. Um, and as much as um, public intellectuals and black public intellectuals were at work during that time, uh, the reconsideration of that moment is often, we are often, we being uh, black, gay and, and queer people are left out of that understanding. And one of the things that I've been talking to with, uh, with Marcus Lee, who is finishing a dissertation, dissertation about black gay politics during that moment is, is that if we understood when we think about this current moment of, uh, of black politics or what people thought was a current moment, what, what was a was an important moment of um, Farrah calls it the moment of incandescence with uh, with with things burning last summer. Um, people want to go back to many times we want to go back to the 1970s or we want to reimagine some some other place without thinking through how the forms of address the 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 politics of intersectionality, which of course is a, has become for some people a buzzword. It is not a buzzword. That those concepts and those movements mm. are so key to understanding where we are now. Yet we have not. And when I say we, I'm you know I'm looking I'm looking at you, black political scientists, right? That, for example. Where is the where is the rethinking of uh, of Kathy's um, blackness and, and uh, uh, the the boundaries? Excuse me, um, AIDS and the boundaries of blackness. Yeah, we already un we have understandings that the work of the work of poets and essayists and even and even uh, scholars in the 1980s did, yet I don't know that we have really learned those lessons. Uh, and I certainly know in classrooms, for example, that we are not, we're not reading Melvin, we should be reading Melvin. I'm guilty also of, of, not, of not thinking as closely and as clearly about what Melvin Dixon was doing, um, that some of us are now thinking, ah, well, Translation is important. Languages are important. Or mm -hmm. maybe we misunderstood negritude and we need to rethink that. Well, mm -hmm. Melvin did that, yet he doesn't show up on our he doesn't mm -hmm. show up on our syllabi, though he's you know waiting for, to listen for his name. Yet, mm -hmm. so this is some of the some of the impulse to do that work, and I think that um, the methodology, the anthological way of approaching it also comes out of what was happening mm. at that moment, right? The importance of multiple voices, the importance of multiple points of view, multiple genre, multiple disciplines uh, that this moment shows us in really beautiful, startling ways um, from all of those, those anthologies. It shows us a way to do that. The, rise the rise of coalitional activism by especially by third world women and uh, and and black women working across class and across sexualities shows us a way to be anthological and that's my 80s uh, that's 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 how i want to rethink those those long 1980s and i also want i also want a, an understanding of the, of the music and of the style that is not, you know, th that is not in a, in a little box that MTV gives us because so much of what we were listening to, you know, never made it on MTV, right? Um, and was not in the mainstream, but was uh, enjoyed by black publics across the world. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe in a way, Jafari, my dear, you're being a little modest, right? Because I'll, I will just give you back four examples of what I mean when I say your take on the 80s through a kind of thinking about the proliferation and productivity of Black queer thought and action. When we think about the 80s, 
and Black folks in the United mm -hmm. States, we here are some of the things that regularly become the way in which that decade is framed. One is through thinking about the, the threat and vulnerability to Black men, where that sensibility of Black maleness is completely heteronormatively rendered, completely articulated through the kind of charismatic politics that Erica Edwards talks about. Mm -hmm. That's one. Or through the idiom of death and the urban, right? The, the kind of decline in, in Black urban spaces, the war on drugs, et cetera, et cetera. And all I'm doing to be clear to anyone who's listening is I'm just reading through what you offer in the book as a reframing. Or um, the way in which even in music, that we get this tension or this argument between hip hop uh, as one kind of authentic black music and then the, the attempts by some black singers to become part of the pop domain. And what you do is you give us a different understanding as a, of another vital trajectory of black music that lives in the decade. And even if we're thinking about like literature and the academy, we get this argument about um, the literary fights about high theory and so on, right? So that what I mean, at least what I get from your reframing the 80s is the discourse of death is not that discourse that I've just gestured to. It's something else. The music is something else. That what you're doing is, it's, I don't wanna call it counter publics. Um, I don't wanna call it vernacular publics, um, but that you, you call together, call together a, a, a gathering of black thought and doing that's happening in the 80s that can be understood through the energies and desires, yes, the desires of Black women in, and their thinking, Black queers and their thinking. And I think for me, that's such a powerful reframing of the Black 80s or of the 80s largely. Um, and that's one of the things you offer in the first maybe the first 50 pages or so of the book. That's why you, for you, the history runs from conditions five, uh, right? Which is 1979 and the black nations, queer nations conference, which is 1995, that you're trying to get us to see another way to understand that decade as then another way we might um, assume and be inspired by the legacy of the, uh, of the work that people did. And so I, I um, I just want to give back to you one of the ways in which as someone who spent time thinking about um, the 80s as a decade and, and teaching the 80s mm -hmm. as a decade that you've just now given me a whole other um, episteme for thinking about that, that decade. Yes, that. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. I, it's, it is, uh, it's quite it's quite a thing to have you um, have you read <laughs> have you read back and and uh, and understand uh, and also restate in a way that that makes it uh, that makes it so clear to me what is what's happening here in this uh, in this work when I look at some of the some of the the works from the archive um, and read some of the names and and also try to think about what people were listening to, what clubs they were going to, what they were reading. Um, it appears to me as a sort of um, as a sort of network, as a sort of um, story that comes that I have to that I have to that I have to piece together. And then to then rethink this from 79 to 95 and write it and then write it over and then write it over again and mm -hmm. then move things around uh, to then now in this moment when it's finally out uh, to have you to have you offer what you have is is is, is also educational for me, right? Um, so thank you. Again, I, it was important for me 
in the beginning to set the scene for the anthological generation so that the reader can understand this as a major piece of a black gay sensibility or black gay habit of mind so that when we come back when we go back and forward through one text to the other to this work to this scene to this that um that the reader can think through how much of this is is resonant um how much of this anthological moment this anthological way of thinking and the moment of the 1980s is present by the time we get to 2010 2012 in the mm-hmm. second part of the in, in the second part of the book yeah. Yeah. and i i misspoke a little bit when i said the first 50 pages i really meant the first 60 pages that is i was thinking about um the the introduction proper pastness as a position where mm-hmm. you do such incredible work to think with the terms of historicization. And then the first chapter in the, in the first section, a stitch, the first section is titled A Stitch in Space Time. And that first chapter there is the anthological generation. So I, I just wanted to say that for anyone who's um, following along and who has the book that th- those first 60 pages, Jafari, where again, you rethink, you give us back the 80s in in maybe in a language that I think for some of us it might be hard to recognize it at least intellectually in that way and then for Mm -hmm. many of us we immediately recognize it because it was also it it was a a time of our own living and we can understand it differently I just yeah there are many things I could praise about this work but for me that that is one for sure that that needs to be said out loud. You've talked about uh, coalitional politics and as a reader of this work in a number of different iterations, I'm also struck by your appreciation of what we might call like dissonant multiplicity, right? In the introduction, Ken made reference to the disco ball and its many refractions and um, you, of course, both in your first book and in this work, you um, call on Audre Lorde's conceptualization of difference. I can't help but think of someone like Mecca Sullivan's um, mm. most recent beautiful book, The Poetics of Difference. Uh, and especially, especially you um, engage Jennifer Nash's um, thinking about Black feminist possessiveness um, in uh, Black Feminist Reimagined, Black Feminism Reimagined. And I just, I would love to hear you say more about why that kind of dissonant multiplicity. I, in another conversation with you, I said, it's almost like a, a version of the sibilance that you talk about. Um, I just, I wonder if you might say something about why dissonance is, is so important for your contending with um, contending with the long 80s in the way that you do? Mm. I think for me, I think two things come to mind immediately. Um, and the first is that, you know, it's, it's, it's in the field, it's in the archive that you know, the, the folks were talking about difference. They were writing their own uh, experiences that were different from the experiences of folks around them, yet within communities, um, they were in some t- sometimes uh, moving against the grain and or calling out harms, and so that's that's all important. And I think that one of the things, one of the reasons it's important to me to deal with uh, the use of difference and dissonance, and I hear also distinction, right, Mm. is that Mm. um, in my experience, and, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that I hope that people get from this um, is that um, for me, uh, in my own experience, difference, dissonance, distinction has never meant alien or Mm. unbelonging, right? Um, You know, I can, I can hear you know, I could hear, you know, people in my neighborhood say stuff like, well, you different, 
right? <laughs> yes. Mm. Clearly, mm. <laughs> clearly, mm. clearly I'm different. But mm. that wasn't you different and therefore you don't live on 143rd Avenue um, right over there, you know, where we know your cousins, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, simply, uh, it simply is a difference or many, many differences. Mm. Back to the anthological, right? And to the way that Audrey taught us to think about uh, to think about difference, but it may also be, and you know, I'm writing a, a finishing finishing a piece for um, for a queer anthropology um, uh, collection, another anthology, right? Uh, and one of the a note from the really brilliant uh, editor, <laughs> um, Margo, was um, I wonder what. I wonder what anthropology does for you, because of course mm. some of it is about you know how I'm not studying it and blah blah blah. But what anthropology does, right? I, I can give anthropology some credit is that it helps us to redefine difference, right, and particularity as concepts that don't necessarily have to be placed on a hierarchy. Mm. Right? So in that way, it's resonant with with Audrey and others, right? Think especially historical particularism. Mm. Um, and that helps us also to get to the movement between New York and Miami and London and Bridgetown and Port of Spain, right? That we can we can understand we can understand difference, but also see resonance. Um, we can see dissonance. Um, uh, we can we can we can see dissonance and appreciate that as something that is perhaps inevitable. And which makes the project stronger, perhaps certainly, um, certainly more complex. And the, the other thing that I hear, um, and you mentioned <laughs> siblings, when I hear my friend James's voice, James Jefferson's voice, I hear his voice a lot, and I'm, I'm grateful. But one of the things is, um, you know, when we were growing up, and I would say something probably crazy would happen. He's, what are you talking about? Right. So the, the, this sort of this sort of record scratch of mm. a, or a mm. or a mm. come on now or mm. or let's get real mm. that sort of corrective mm. um, I think is is extremely important and is part of a of a of a black gay habit of mind that sometimes ends up you know ends up sounding and looking like you know an old low down dirty read mm. and other times it seems like keeping it cute when you really when just mm. a, a raise of the eyebrow or a purse of the lip will betray mm. or tell mm. the real story and so those those terms difference dissonance distinction are are key I mean, oh wow desire there's another one so it's four that they that they it's important that those those come together mm. Hmm. I hadn't thought about um, just listening to your response and how you stitch those terms, stitched those terms together. Um, I hadn't thought about this, but um, one of the things I hear you also saying is, you know, you did this project without leaning on the ease of a term like authenticity, right? Um, such that, uh, your, your appreciation of the aesthetic intelligence of mm. the, the writing and thinking and doing, the activist doing, um, the dance floor doings um, of the, the subjects in, in the book doesn't lean on trying to articulate precisely um, authentic ways of Black queer doing, but instead, like, respects this kind of manyness. And uh, I, I'm not articulating this well, but in my head, it connects with early in the project. You say something like, um, you you talk about the uh, the the phrase that sometimes scholars use to push each other to say something like, write something that your grandmother could or would understand or, or, mm -hmm. or would read. And you're very careful to say, now, as much as you appreciate this, that you also want to resist it a little bit because 
sometimes implied in it is a kind of simplicity that doesn't respect the fact that the vernacular saying or the saying that seems um, that seems clear actually has in it a kind of manifoldness that requires work, right? Which is mm -hmm. which takes me back to the overture um, you make to the reader in that invitation that this is a call to work and that your book is a call for the reader to work in the way that say Toni Morrison, uh, people talk about Toni Morrison's work as demanding something of the reader. And so I feel like there's a connection between all of those ideas, be between your regard for the dissonant, sibilant voice, as well as your um, reluctance to, to, to uh, calcify authenticity. And also then this sense of a vernacular poetics vernacular intelligence that is indeed anthological that it only works because of its manyness even if the right even if the, mm -hmm. the 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 pieces of it would to strain the the kind of coherence right i hope that i hope that people hear that right because i, I it's extremely important to me to both of uh, To not be authentic, but you know, John Jackson, you know, writes against our pretension toward, toward authenticity and implores us to to think through sincerity in, instead, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. this is uh, in the ethnographic in the ethnographic enterprise, and to understand the complexity of what your grandmother said or what some person said or what is some phrase that an old black person at the bus stop says to you that people think of as folk or think of as silly or nothing but is has this this epistemic brilliance in it only if you listen right so that 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 work that you that you say there it, it is an invitation for for people to to lean in a bit and listen a bit more closely and also to appreciate difference in a way that is that I have chosen to write some of this in standard American English. Some of it, some of it is in slightly stilted uh, <laughs> theoretical language, not, not a lot of it. Some of it in florid prose that entertains me. Um, <laughs> and a lot of it, I think, um, like you were saying, may not may be foreign to some people, but Kevin read it, right, and got it, right. There are a few, other, and it's okay to write to us. It's it's so it's okay to it's okay to dwell in the intramural, mm. and um, I think that at least some of us have to do it. Because the the pull to to always explain ourselves to make ourselves crystal clear, um, I think some people do that work really very well, and that's a that's a particular task, a uh, particular a particular calling or ministry. Mm -hmm. um, it's not my ministry, and it feels sometimes so violent to me mm -hmm. uh, to make things crystal clear and it's certainly not a black gay thing so for example you know there's much to do now about people being confused about using um using non-gendered pronouns but i remember very clearly black folks saying you know the person yeah i'm, I'm seeing you know i'm talking to this person and this person is really nice to me and this person you know me and this person mm -hmm. we go into you know we go into the mall and this person we doing this with this person and they and they and they right mm -hmm. part of part of that language that's mm -hmm. not new mm -hmm. right was to keep folks out of your business mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, so you you need not know <laughs> you need you need not know you you need not have a um a, a proper noun you need not have a a gendered pronoun there um it is this person that is to say that um 
and of, you know, and of course, there's Barbara Christian, right? Uh, that is to say, and she's saying, you know, that that we have always been a race for theory, right? The hieroglyphic that it is not always it is not always clear. It is it is always something that 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 is meant uh, on various levels. And so that piece about your grandmother, um, I understand. I understand the impulse, but I think that it is that we need to we need to we need to really think about it more carefully and i will also say that i hear it the most from um from students at elite institutions um who complain about mm. the language because mm. one's grandmother can't understand right when mm. the student's mm. grandmother that i'm talking to is a famous literary theorist right mm. so it doesn't it really doesn't it doesn't fly with me the other thing is that as an ethnographer i understand that my job is really pulling out, um, not pulling out, but describing, not pulling it, describing and, and languaging what I'm learning from what people are doing and saying and creating. Mm. And so it's really not my job to explain to my grandmother, right, or someone, because they already know. Mm. Mm. So some of the stuff that, you know, that we've talked mm. about, about difference and uh, distinction, about desire, um, this is this is not this is not something that I would have to explain to my aunt Barbara, right? Um, the language might be mm-hmm. that is to mm-hmm. say that the that the the ethics of it, the the uh, the politics of it, the, the history of, of it, it. Hmm? the inte- the intelligence of it, the intelligence yes. of it. Yeah. Is hers. Yes. 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 Right? Yes. I'm trying to write it into the record for the rest of y'all. Yes. Right. So 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 that so that so that that knowledge, so that our ways of being, or at least the way that I see our ways of being, is in the record and part of our uh part of our toolkit in a serious way and is is brought to classrooms and to collectives and to and to political cells and to literal cells right for people to rethink and reimagine reimagine what is already ours mm. Mm. you know i oh jafari um hmm. I started by saying, baby, let's talk about desire. Now I feel like, oh, well, I'll come back to that. Um, you just mentioned uh, in, in, in talking about that, you mentioned citational practice and uh, early readers of this book have talked about your, um, your citational practice of um, speaking of, of many of the people in the in the work by their first names which I read in part as a kind of uh, akin to the to the intimacy that you set up both in the invitation to the reader and also to the sense of desire this sense of almost being there right the kind of Mm. dexis the dexis closeness a closeness that demands um responsibility but not a responsibility that you Jafari the scholar could impose on someone all you can do is remind people if you want to be here you have to be responsible to what is here Mm -hmm. and um i love that and i just want you know um this might seem like an easy trick but everything you were just saying about how we ought to be careful with where we locate intelligence how we articulate it how we appreciate its, its capaciousness. Everything you were just saying is there in your beautiful thinking about Joe Fairchild being, Joe was my first. He was for a lot of us. Now I'm reading again back to you. But like my deep forestalled adoration, meeting his intense gaze from the back cover of In the Life, but never in person. His status as everyone's imaginary movement baby daddy would find him feeling lonely and dying alone if his letters and the testimony of many who knew him are accurate. 
Here's a stumbling start to one story retold. In the harsh Atlanta sun, when I temporarily lost sight of the grace I could hold, I imagined it was Joseph Beam's voice that first called me by my new name before putting his lips on mine, his hand in mine. And then you go on to talk about in the life. And then you go on to talk about desire. Why did I read that to you? Because what you've done is exampled for us what it is to take a, a vernacular and even a kind of queer idiom, right? Joe Beam was my first, right? As, as a queer Black boy, baby, I know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> and you, you take it and then you ride, you were talking about some of the language being florid, but you, you just kind of ride the poetry of it to a greater and greater accountability for all of its meaningfulness, the personal meaningfulness to the speaker, the way in which that meaningfulness ex extends to in the life, that anthology, that vital anthology, which you then pull out to, to talk to us about the history of that anthology, which later sets up your paying attention to the anthological. And I think it is that, whew, I think it's that um, thoroughness or at least a, 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 an investment in trying to be thorough with the small desirous gestures that you do so well in this book. Um, if one thinks that, uh, or if one beholds this book by its magnificent cover and the cover is magnificent, then I think it's easy to flatten what the book does. You do such incredible archival work. You, Take us back to the Black Heart Collective. You recover all of Asato Saint's essay, um, Haiti, A Memory Journey. And, but you do it in this way where it, you used concentric circles earlier, where it both radiates in and out from the small precise thing. That for me, and, and perhaps after I say this, I should wind myself back down from feeling like, um, like I'm preaching, that for me, is a, time, model, is a model of another method for doing deep Black studies. We don't have to be so assaulted by or turned off by the presumed gestures of rigor in the academy that we give up the rigor that our life and study demands. We can find mm -hmm. other ways to do rigor. And anybody... Anybody listening, this is page um, eight of the, of the invitation. It's Roman numeral page eight. Read that paragraph. A beautiful example of what rigor from the small looks like. In another place, you talk about minor to minor, right? That rather than minor to major or major to minor, that you're interested in minor to minor. That's what it looks like. Jafari, I, I, love, I love the book. I love the work. And I just wanted to to make sure we didn't lose that expansiveness too. You will think with Du Bois and Trouillot and David Scott, and you will think with Kevin Aviance, and you would think with a line from Audre Lorde's poetry, but in each occasion, it, it radiates out um, towards its depth. It is beautiful work. Um, I hope that many of us tell you over and again, it is beautiful work, and there is much to learn in, in spending time with it. Thank you. Um, I remember. I remember uh, when I when the book. I thought the book was done, but now I know that it was probably half done. When I asked you and Robert Reefar, and you must always say the three names together. Robert, Robert Reefar has three <laughs> names. You have to say all three names. <laughs> When uh, when I showed up to when you all came and, and and showed up so generously to help me think through the manuscript that I thought was was finished, um, and I had such anxiety. Mm. It's all right, baby. I remember you talking about this thoroughness. I remember this notion, you, you talking about uh, completing the line. Mm. 
Mm. And you know, I, I wrote that down in my little field, my little, little field notebook, right? Uh, and I reread, you know, <laughs> and I, I reread what was then, you know, your last book, which of course now there's there's another, right? And I I reread Black Gay Man, Robert's collection. Um, and there's something that 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 was also a way of rethinking a black gay habit of mind that's a black gay habit of study that tries to do what I've tried to do here, right? That that tries to honor the what people call them the vernacular, right? Um, that calls in various ways of of knowing that we have. And I wanted to, I just wanted to make it real clear, mm. you know, and I'm you know, not as not as sophisticated as you and Robert Reef are, you know, I'm, I'm an ethnographer, so I just, I, it is it is clear, right? So the the names, the first names is still something that, and I, I heard, I, I heard someone, um, someone say the other day, oh, you know, I get your, I heard your explanation, but still I wonder how people are going to think, and I still wonder how people are going, some people who I call by their last first names are going to feel about that. And I hope that they see mm. that, see this practice, see the practice that Kevin Aviance theorizing mm -hmm. the disco ball is as incisive <laughs> as anything I could have pulled from Lacan to talk about mirrors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. and that, um, and to, and to lay that side by side with, with, with David Scott and Sadia Hartman and all, all, all these folks. And the other thing is that the, that some of this ar arises from my field, from my, from my notebooks and from mm -hmm. my, uh, and from my free writing. And I don't ever say, Cohen says, right? I'm thinking about Kathy Cohen mm. because mm. I'm thinking as I'm writing about what she might say and the eyebrow that she might raise as I'm writing. And so it is also a practice of my creating an intimacy between me and, and the page uh, that reflects the intimacy that I, that I feel with all of the people that I, you know, that end up in here and that, that Stephen so lovingly made sure was in the index. One of the things that makes me really happy is that, you know, there are people in, in the index who ought to be there because they ought to be here mm -hmm. because, because their work is constitutive, is part of this story, even if, there is no book to cite, right? Mm -hmm. That that's all part of the of the of what I wanted to what I wanted to create, what I want to want us to really think through for the future. Mm -hmm. um, thanks to thanks to you and to Robert, I can I can admit that this that I did want to write a theory of Black gay life. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say that before; it seemed too grand, right? Mm -hmm. Um, or that I wanted to rethink and offer a a renewed methodological a, a renewed methodological theoretical nexus for Black studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's I didn't say that there because it's kind of not my style. But that is I'll say publicly that is precisely what I wanted to do, and I want people to read it, read it carefully, and argue with me and push it forward and correct and do better, um, but to really think about this as another way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my God, we certainly need other ways. I mean, the ways that we have mm -hmm. clearly are not really working very well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love that and I love in your use of the first names, you even in the very beginning say to the reader again, you know, I'm using these names and I'm taking responsibility for this kind of citational practice. If that is your way, do it too, but be accountable to it, right? So that a theory of Black gay life, 
not the theory, a theory. It is a, a theory that, that radiates out of Joe Beam was my first. It is a theory that says, I'm looking around at all of this work that black women and or black queers are doing. And this is going to be the way in which I'm gonna understand the eighties. It's a theory that in, in thinking through, and I love that you've just um, so, so quickly glossed part of, the, um, part of the work you're doing. Some might even say the intervention you're doing both in regards to say anthropology and black studies is a, another iteration of what a minor theory can look like. I can't help but think of uh, Saidia Hartman's work or Christina Sharp, what Christina Sharp did within the wake by beginning with the, the minor heft of a loss and another loss and another loss that then radiates out into what um, we, we, uh, uh, Professor Sharp's next book, Ordinary Note, right? Um, uh, just, uh, just astonishing. And um, in another instance, I said to a, a colleague that I understood your work as a different way of thinking about autopoiesis. And um, I think that I think that is true too, that I think you're offering us a way. So many of us want to use the, the material of our lives. So many of us who are black want to use the material of our lives um, for the intelligence that's there and trying to find ways to do that, that um, yeah, that, that has to find ways to do it that, that completes the line of the thought. And that's so funny you remembered that phrase. That's a phrase I love. My students are probably annoyed by it. But um, as a person who can't sing or write music, there's nothing I love more than the responsibility and the struggle to try, to try, to try to complete the line of a thought. Um, I wonder before we turn to Q&A, Jafari, is there, is there anything else that you wanted to think about and, and talk about in regards to this book, and then we can turn to Q&A and then find our way to finish the conversation. Is there anything in, in, in the exchange that's happened between us that you want to pick up and come back to? There's a lot. I have lots of scribblings, right? Uh, but the, 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 overwhelming, the overwhelming thing I want to come back to is, is where we started with, with gratitude uh, for your meticulousness um, for, and your generosity uh, and the, the depth of, of your reading. And it really, if, if, if I want to say anything about this work, it's a, uh, the lavishness of, of, um, mm. of your response and of, of things that I've heard from, from folks who, you know, before even, you know, before it reached their hand, before it reached their hands, the people being grateful just for the thinking around these folks and this moment, it, it means, it means the world to me. And um, it makes me, it, it makes me even more, uh, more committed to, uh, to doing more and doing better and to refining, to continue to talk about this. Uh, and you you read um, a piece uh, the piece that I that I, I may have read and it was beautiful hearing it hearing it back to you uh, but this last piece the acknowledgments uh, begins this is a sort of extended acknowledgement of my bonds with and thanks to conversation partners ancestors and friends here and there and then it goes on to not be a regular acknowledgement, but a but another but another chapter, and it it occurs to me um, reading this that this is incomplete, and the real acknowledgement is going to be in these these conversations mm. where I i'm confronted with um with what i've done what i could have done better what i um what i aspired to do what i didn't mean to do but did anyway how it lands with 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 readers readers like i imagined like you and all of the people that you that you've mentioned 
um, and readers that I had not imagined before. So thank you. And I'm really eager to hear what, what folks uh, have to say about all of your really incisive and beautiful commentary. Thank mm. you. Mm. Well, I will, um, I'll just turn to the q and A. It seems like there's a, a rich conversation happening in the chat, which um, oh, wow. I, I, okay. I, yeah, I haven't been able <laughs> to follow because I've been trying to pay attention to you, but there are a couple of questions in the q and A. And so maybe we'll try to take just a few of them so we can make sure to, to end close to eight o'clock. Um, um, one person wrote, Y'all have already talked about this a little bit, but I have a question about how it felt, and the word felt is uh, emphasized, for Jafari to return to the long 80s or any of the time places in the book while he was writing this book and what it gave to him or asked from him in the context of the contemporary moment of his writing the book to return to desire, loss, conflicts, contacts of this period. Um, and then they go on to, to say, right. I appreciate this work as a Black gay companion to Alexis Pauline Gums's idea of intergenerational reading praxis mm -hmm. of Black queer mothering in her dissertation work on Black lesbian feminism and in other places that Gums has articulated that. So I wonder if you might say something about how it felt to return to the long 80s and maybe by extension, I wonder if um, is that a, is that part of what music does for you in your everyday life and in in the way in which it works its way through the through the book? You know, and and Philip, my love, uh, will tell you that I live. <laughs> Sometimes it may be annoying to him that that I live in the long nineteen eighties with the music. I'm constantly I'm constantly mm -hmm. playing this music. Um, and because it is, it's part of a, a memory practice also that it, it cues memories or it cues thinking of a particular, uh, a particular moment, but it felt, how did it feel? It felt um, difficult. It felt tender. It felt um, agonizing at some points um, to, to think through lots of loss, um, to think through, um, and become angry, uh, to be grateful for uh, for folks who who loved and protected me, um, and it also it also felt and I learned um, I learned through what I call in the book a sort of ethnographic failure of not because Melvin says the epidemic living and the dead, and then he says the epidemic dead and the living, that there are people who are living who I mm -hmm. could have picked up the phone and talked to them about some of this, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that's a, a, another conversation <laughs> another conversation about that, that uh, Stephen Fullwood brought this up to me also, and the feeling also was that I wanted to remain I wanted to remain in my own intramural space with my notes, with the works, with the people, with my memory, without that sort of um, those sorts of conversations. So, just to be to be quick, it 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 felt difficult, and also like I could scarcely do anything else. Like I absolutely mm -hmm. had to do it, um, and that. Uh, and that Melvin was very clear about listening for his name. Mm -hmm. um, it felt as if um, I was called to offer something. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it. That's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, um, Alexis Pauline Gums's work is uh, essential and and central, especially to the story that we tell in the last part about archives and thinking through our our responsibility to the archives and our responsibility to tell the stories um, that are left there that can just remain unless they are, uh, um, unless they are used and activated. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 
like you, I when I read the book, the book is 415 glorious pages and um, and and doesn't doesn't feel like that um, because of the the fluencies of voice on the page and also feels much more than that because there is so much in it. Um, and this is a segue to the next question. Um, you do this thing where in a way you, you keep the kind of formal discourse uh, or the explicit discourse about method uh, near the end of the book, the last couple of chapters of the book, though, of course, if one is paying attention, the invitation is already a method. The citational practice is a method. Um, the, the overture to desire is already an articulation of method. The point about minor to minors, right? So that it is, it is not, not as if one has to read well into the book to get to your thinking about method. But um, someone in the Q&A asked, Jafari, since you've mentioned both Black studies and anthropology in terms of what they distinctively offer in terms of method, can you bring those together or are they best as distinct contributions to thought and the politics of research and writing? And I thought this might be an occasion to get you to say a little bit more about the ways in which you are uh, imagining, uh, as you phrase it, another way, both through um, in terms of anthropology and in some ways in terms of black studies. You say something about that? Yes, so the, the, the questioner is, is, uh, is the inimitable uh, Jackie Brown. Thank you, uh, thank you Jackie for that, that, that question. Um, and I think that I have to say, and, and I'll, I'll say this quickly, that one of the reasons that the, the book took long to do is that the first the first iteration of the book which you didn't see the very first one was sort of a collection of case studies it was a multi-sided ethnography right mm. um and it was um i thought corny and nobody asked for it other than the yale social science <laughs> committee you know to promote me to full professor right and it was read. It was so full of all of the anxiety of the academy, or in that particular moment for me, that the the shift away, at least in my mind, right in my mind, I shifted away from disciplinary anthropology to a practice of listening and looking. That's a, of course. Uh, th that's of course um, conditioned by that because of my training, right? But it allowed me to rethink what I was doing and what other people had done in terms of what I call here ethnographic sensibility. That is that when, for example, uh, Joe is, um, is writing Making Ourselves from Scratch, he's talking about being in a place, he is at a lunch counter. And at the lunch counter in Philadelphia, there are all of these different black men from various parts of Philadelphia. And then his imagination goes to Barbados. His imagination goes to mm. Berlin, right? Mm. And he's, he gives a sense of the, di again, difference, distinction between these people. Of course, we see that in Audre Lorde. Of course, we see this in Pat Parker, right? This mm. understanding of of different historical particular uh, particularism, of uh, of giving a good uh, sense of a uh, of a place or of an ethos, those are things that we try to as anthropologists train anthropologists to see in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, for me, that's that is that is a black studies practice that's not necessarily anthropological that is a poetic process that is the way that you know our best novelists see um and so i, I have in in this work really um didn't think much about anthropology as a as a discipline or a practice until the until the very end as mm. as kevin says and it is a late, it's a late entry, 
right? It is a late entry here to recast this sort of field work or I call it a friendship crisis, a field work crisis that I had to rethink that in terms of, um, of being, of doing black on black ethnography, right? Mm. Um, and I found after, uh, after uh, Dunnett Francis uh, 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 showed me uh, the essay on, um, on the quarrel, um, the quarrel as a West Indian and her contention as a West Indian condition um, of, of, intellectual, of intellectual back and forth that I was able to then add the voices of Black anthropologists because it helped me to really, uh, to really see so more closely these notions of what Zora called, you know, skin folk, all skin folk aren't, all skin folk ain't kin folk, right? Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. naivete for most of my life until, you know, three months ago, <laughs> really wanting to make that true, <laughs> really wanting to make it true that, 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 that we're all kin folk. And my, right, so all of this to say, um, Jackie, that um, it comes, the suggestion here is that it can come together and that it has come together and that we don't necessarily need something called anthropology to make it happen. Um, and that the refusal to frame it and frame it anthropologically and to do, as Kevin said, just sort of show what the method is to show the framework without that is also a way to say that we've, you know, we're now 40 something years into pushing for the decolonization of anthropology, for anthropologists to listen, et cetera, and I'm over it. Um, and the other thing is that we didn't talk about is the, is the black queer part of this and the, 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 the thinking through who's missing in the citational framework who is not in the conversation in Black studies, and also saying to certain partisans of Black studies that refuse to recognize that Black feminism has completely re reinvigorated and changed Black studies forever, thank goodness, that I'm also over that, right? So mm -hmm. the, 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 drawing the, the drawing those stark lines and, say, and saying that um, is not the style of this work, but I, but I I would like people to to understand that. Mm -hmm. Jafari is, um, I know the phrase ethnography of an idea shows up both in the book and also mm -hmm. was an early, earlier articulation of the title. Is, is, is this then an ethnography of an idea, an ethnography of, of an idea of desire or an ethnography mm -hmm. of desire as an idea? It is now. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're, you're so you're so amenable to my to my to my nonsense. So I can I'm say more about that, just, but say some, but say something. But but I think that no, but the, the the ethnography of an idea was was that the idea the idea is black gay, mm. and so in the beginning the first the first subtitle was like black queer here and there, which uh, has problems, right? Um, and then ethnography and idea that was that phrase was raised um, by Michael Denning. I'm very thankful to him in uh, when I gave a presentation in his Americanist thinkers class, uh, grad class at Yale, and he was drawing a distinction between my first book, which was an ethnography of of special period Cuba. Right, so we're on that island during a particular point in time. That's the way that we usually do work. And he said, ah, this is not the ethnography of a place, it's an ethnography of an idea, which really helped me to think through, or it was resonant with my experience of traveling with the terms gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, et cetera, and the term black from place to place, and there being various ways that those terms are um, are used or not used or 
used only contingently, et cetera. And I had just come back from Trinidad. I had just come back from from um, from Trinidad and, and Tobago when uh, when I gave that presentation and had had a conversation with Colin Robinson um, during which he told me again, and he had told me before that you know this whole you know that he knows that I'm enamored of this you know of this black 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 thing, but it's just not going to fly here in, in Trinidad and Tobago. And think think this think it through and i had begun writing in my notes response a response to a response to him before my next trip i don't know where i was going next and so the ethnography is the ethnography of an idea is more uh more resonant with that that methodological practice of going from place to place to place and asking people a series of questions about their racial and color identification and what that has to do with their gender identification, what that has to do with their with their politics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's mm -hmm. that's where that comes mm -hmm. from. But mm -hmm. I can also, you know, I'm not just being completely agreeable, but you know, and the, um, the idea of desire that works for me. Also, if we if we if we want to focus out, right, to have a, a, a broader a broader mm. view a broader mm. view, because there's so many channels of desire here that I want to I want the reader to consider. Mm. Mm. And I in in another moment I could make the case right for a desire because in the way that desire becomes Joe Beam was my first desire becomes the, the habitat for describing a kind of energy of Black queerness in the 80s, a kind of energy, particularly through Black feminist discourses. Um, Pat Parker telling us what kind of world she imagines and wants. Audre Lorde telling us, those are articulations of desire, right? The Cumbahee mm -hmm. River Collective um, announcing what kind of world and politic it wants. And so there's a way, um, uh, yeah, there's a way in which to desire, desire becomes the idea of um, a, an idea that can articulate and express so many of the things you're articulating about the long 80s. Um, I'm going to give you the last word, but I, I have to say to you, um, there are many things I love uh, about you and about the work. I love that you call so many names, even just in the last five minutes, you've called Donette's name and you've called Melvin and Joe and Pat and Audra, you've called beautiful Stephen Fullwood and Colin. And um, there's something about that as a, as a serious part of your practice that I, I just really admire and love. Um, I think Jafari, you're a, a troubadour for our, difficult times and indeed a troubadour of the difficult times that the 80s represented and were. Um, and by troubadour, I truly mean that kind of medieval French poet musician who in the act of composing is also theorizing, right? That they sung mm. about love. So in the act of composing songs, they were theorizing about love and they were trying to gather and inspire the crowd to move the crowd in a kind of 80s idiom. Um, that as I know you and as I read the work, you're, you're taken by and in the act of composing and you are taken up in the act of trying to inspire us. I just, I think it's magnificent. Um, and the last thing I want to say to you, though we should have a longer conversation about here and there because, because those Dexis terms I think are very powerful indicators of the kind of intimacy which I think you are working from and they are, they are also precisely the right terms, um, but the title uh, which comes from a work of art. There's a disco ball between us. I love the way that that title, if we're thinking with uh, Kenneth Burke's thinking about rhetoric, the phrase is at once indicative, that is it, it, that is, it names something, and it's also imperative. 
in that it demands that you encounter or acknowledge an experience, as in there is a disco ball between us. And I think in that way, the title is perfect for what you've done. You've articulated something that's indicative, trying to name the thing, and also um, offered up a kind of imperative. Uh, and as I read the book and read and sit with it and think with you and think with other people about it, that too strikes me. And I wanted to give that back to you as a modest way of saying, thank you, dear beautiful one. I'm gonna give you the last word. The, the last word is this thank you. Um, the troubadour, you, I, I can't help but you, you say troubadour and I see and hear Roberta Flack mm. and Donny Hathaway, right? Mm. Um, and the song, this, the um, Be Real, it, Be Real Black for Me. Be Real Black for Me. Right. Um, because it, it goes to what you're saying about the troubadour uh, being, being taken herself or himself um, and in the act of composition, you are, you are theorizing, you have taken something from, from what you see, right? As the, as the composer uh, that Donny Hathaway and Roberta Flack are of course in this moment of, in the throes of, uh, in, in the throes of Black is Beautiful, wanting to give, uh, wanting to give that back to the people, wanting to, uh, put that to music so that it can it can be everywhere the way sound travels the, the way sound travels everywhere and the, and the 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 notion that um, that that I might in some small way be able to do that with uh, with with my work is is really um, is really beautiful and exciting for me because this is you know I want to I want to do what what they did right I want to I want to celebrate black beauty and I want to uh, I, I want to honor um, black glory right and black humor both black humor right and and um, the way that we the way that we 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 speak where hard things can be talked about, um, but in a way that may, uh, don't have to be, don't have to be so hard, don't have to lead to, to despair. Um, so that is, that is really important to me. Um, and I'm gonna sit with this, the notion of the troubadour. And you know, the, the other thing that I think about is that it goes deep, goes deeply to you know who I am as you know the little boy who was listening to his mother as she sewed and sang, mm -hmm. and the man mm -hmm. who listens to his mm -hmm. husband sew and sing, mm -hmm. who can't sing, and you know doesn't <laughs> doesn't sew right. So those I grew up um, enamored of creation, mm -hmm. right, and I could see. From a little piece of tissue paper and some pins and some some fabric, what my mother's able to create, mm. right? Or I I hear I hear a note that she that she sings, and I hear you know I see Philip with a pad and a pen mm. that turns into a sketch that turns into a pattern that turns into a garment, mm. and it is a mystery. <laughs> it is it is a mystery to me. And so, to be in this in this framework of a troubadour of of an of of artistic production that um, that takes from uh, from what's happening and transforms through a loving practice of composition something that other people can share is 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 a gift and is wonderful. Um, and the last the last line, so that I don't mess it up um, is to to read uh, just a last the la a last piece from from the book that 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 says something that I wanted to say um, so uh, here well 
Theorists of many stripes mistake the position at the edge of decision as a permanent one and fail to see it as a critical locus of enunciation meant to highlight and enable those within the most dangerous crosshairs. They read a shoreline as an insignificantly small place, not a continent whose ebbs and flows beget other continents and from which sisters and brothers have already changed the world for the better. They misread alone, and here I'm obviously talking about Audrey's litany for survival, not understanding that the final line of the poem, it is better to speak, remembering, gives us precisely the incantation to transform alone to community, speech, action that instantiates an us, we, siempre hasta, like bread in our children's mouths. This is not pathological, no melancholy in this historicism, but rather mourning, anger, love, and aliveness. This is a condition of blackness. And so I want to offer that as a sort of coda for this conversation and a, a reminder that what you've done here, what you've offered me and all of us is another, is a, is, is a suture, is a bringing us together and creating something bigger than the work that I've created here. And I uh, thank you and thank everyone for your wonderful attention. Thanks so much. Thanks to both of you. This is a really, really beautiful moving evening and um, very happy that we could all be here in community. If you know it's the right community when you see so many people who are called out actually in attendance and um, couldn't have been more meaningful or and I could not be more thankful. So good night, everybody. And thanks so much for coming. And thank you, Jafari. Thank you for Kevin. Um, thank you. Hope uh, to can see we, you all again we, soon. Are we going to save all of the, because I didn't get to read the, are we going to save the Q&A? Can that be saved? Or do I? I think we can save the chat and I think the Q&A. And the chat. Thank you so much. Take care.